All right, church. Well, this weekend is one of my favorite weekends uh, because it's a reminder that church is not coming to show up to watch one guy preach, but church is actually the gathered together body of believers. And I love that God isn't just doing something on Sunday. Anybody know that? Like God just doesn't show up on Sunday. He shows up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the whole week. And so every week when we get together, we have an opportunity to encourage one another. But there are special weekends, celebration weekends, where we just kind of ask people to get up and talk about that. Not like random people, so don't start sweating yet. Uh, we ask people to get up and just share this. What has God been doing in your heart lately? And it's a reminder that every one of us, God is working in our hearts and in our lives, calling us toward Christ to live and love more like him. And so this is one of my favorite weekends because I get to be ministered to, to listen to what God has been doing in your hearts and in your lives. And so we're going to have Holly, Mark, and Abby today who are all going to be sharing what God has been doing in their hearts and lives. And I hope that this is a blessing and encouragement to you to know that God is working in and among us, that he is alive and active, and that his word is working among us. And so I hope that you give them a hearty welcome and thank you. Uh, for blessing us with the word that they have for us today. So I'm going to have Holly get up and share what God has been doing in your heart and life. When Matt asked me to do this, um, or asked me if I'd be interested in doing it, I said, of course. And um, putting it into 10 minutes might be hard, but I'm going to do my best. Um, he, he asked me to talk about like something that's been going on in my life recently. And so I struggled a little bit with it because, honestly, I... There's a lot going on in this season for me, emotionally and spiritually, and I feel like I'm learning or relearning everything I was ever taught about what it means to be a Christian. And this has been a like an 18 to 24 month journey for me. And I like went to a Bible college, like I took theology classes, I took church history, I took all of the classes. I pretty much was like born in the church. My parents were at the church the weekend that I was born and I've been going ever since and been doing ministry for the last 10 years. Um, and in all of that, I was pretty well versed in the things of Jesus and the things that he's done. But I think along the way, I never stopped to ask who he really was. And I read this passage a while back. It's, it'll be up on the screen here. It's out of the book of first John. And this, this verse really set me in motion to what, this journey was going to be for me um, a few years ago. So I'll read it for you. It says, see how very much our father loves us for he calls us his children. And that, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And over the last 18 to 24 months, I've been pondering a question. And this question has deconstructed. I know it's like a big word right now, deconstruction. But like, as I mean, it's, I think it's a big word for a reason. Because I think like through COVID, we all went through a season where we had to ask hard questions of ourselves. And one of the questions that's really been um, at the crux of this journey for me is who is Jesus really? Like, who's Jesus? Yes. Who is Jesus? Who really is he? And that question led to a ton others. Like, what is his heart? What, are his, what is his heart for people? What is his heart for me? Do I actually know the heart of Christ, of love, of gentleness, of compassion and grace? Who is Jesus to me? And what am I missing by not knowing who he really is? So I thought I would take you a little bit on a journey with me of what I found about who Christ is, just a few things, and why this changes everything. Because before knowing who Christ is, these are some of the things that we can fall into, and these are things I fall into daily, so just like, don't be like, oh, wow, that's me. That's me, actually. So um, things that we can fall into when we don't know the actual heart of Christ is insecurity, because we haven't understood who we really belong to. We feel unloved because we don't understand the magnitude of love and of love that Christ has in his heart for his children. We experience worry and anxiety because we can't comprehend the unrestrained witness of Jesus in every single moment. And I could go on and on, and I know I'm not alone in all these things, and I think you guys could add a ton more. And all that to say, I think these things, 
you know, don't just go away. These are things that we struggle with and we still will struggle with. But when we know the heart of Jesus and what his heart is for us as an individual, as if I were the only person on this world, Christ's heart would not be any less for me. We can start to see the ways that the enemy lies to us and we start to understand Christ's heart for us more. You know, this is my main point for the day. Um, what I've come to know is exposure to Jesus' story pales in comparison to experiencing the heart of Christ. Like, I think, I'm going well, to say it again. Exposure to the story of Jesus pales in comparison to experiencing the heart of Christ. And what I mean is, I think we all know what Jesus has done. We all know the story of Jesus. And I think everyone sitting here comes every weekend and we we're, we're praying, we're hoping for things from God. And I've done that my whole life. I've been told like what it means to be a Christian. But what I think I was missing was truly experiencing the heart of Christ, not just knowing the story about him. So then what is his heart for you? The book that has been really transformational for me in this is a book called Gentle and Lowly, and I'm sure you've heard us talk about it before. I'm sure a few of you have read it because I feel like it's a book we've been talking about for a few years. If you haven't read this book, please read this book. It is truly life-changing to understand and see in written form, not just like he takes like scriptures from people that lived like hundreds of years ago who I think they were so much smarter about who God was than, than the, sometimes we read books now. Um, and then we also, he also uses scripture. This book has been absolutely transformational. And maybe the most profound thing to me in this season is summed up in this quote. The battle of the Christian life is to bring your own heart into alignment with Christ. That is getting up each morning and replacing your natural orphan mindset. How many of you just, that like resonated with me so much because I feel like every morning I wake up and I'm re-lost. And I just go and I'm walking lost every day sometimes until, until I take that orphan mind and put it with a mindset of full and free adoption in the family of God through the work of Christ, our older brother, who loved you and gave himself for you out of, the, out of the overflowing fullness of his gracious heart. So this is where it gets really good because this is what the shift is in me. Because many of you have heard the verse in Romans 12, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, that's a great, that's, I think that's essentially what he's saying here too, but this is the difference for me. Because I've been a Christian for a really long time and I think I'm just like getting it a little bit maybe for the first time in a long time. <laughs> Um, this is the shift. Holly, get up in the morning and do these three things to transform your mind. The shift is, Holly, wake up and gaze upon me and I will transform your heart. Yeah. So I'll explain it like this. Like, okay, I grew up in nature. Well, no, I didn't grow up in nature. No, I didn't grow up in nature. I grew up... Like, by nature, I mean, like, hiking and camping and, like, being outside for any period of time other than just, like, to walk to your car. Um, so my, like, outdoor time looked like, like, playing in my parents, like, super lush grass, green grass until it got, like, hot or humid at 10 a.m. in the morning. So that, that was my outside time. And I drove around, and I saw beautiful sights. My family traveled all over the country. We lived in an RV for a year, and we drove around the whole country and did ministry as a family. And so I saw, like, the mountains of California and, like, all, I mean, I just saw a lot of things. I was exposed to, like, a lot of nature. Um, but then I married a mountain man from Maine. And he, like, grew up in a different kind of nature. Like, he grew up, like, outside. <laughs> um, and then we got married. And then he was like, let's go camping. And so, like, I experienced nature in a way that I never had being exposed to it from a car. Um, so what happened... The first morning I ever woke up in a tent. Now, I think a lot of people don't really like tent camping. And I honestly don't really like tent camping, sorry. But <laughs> what I really experienced the first morning I ever woke up in a tent was you woke up and you wake up kind of with the sunrise and the dew is like on the tent and you're kind of cold and you can see your breath and, and you can just smell the trees. And it was so profoundly beautiful to me. And what I 
understood in that moment is that this is what experiencing nature is really like. What happened in that moment is I went from exposure to the outdoors to fully experiencing it, and it became a whole body experience for me. Like I can remember vividly the moment. And I'm sure you have a story in your life that is coming to mind when different stories of exposure or fully experiencing the difference between experiencing Jesus and having exposure to the story of Jesus. For me, okay, when I began to gaze at Jesus and truly experience him, something changed in me. It went from like 2D to 3D. Like, went from like sound to, uh, to like video, visual. It went from black and white to full color. What I wanna ask you this morning, who is the one that you're actually following? We all come here singing and worshiping. We all pray, we all lift Jesus up and he draws us closer to himself hoping, um, like we're hoping that this week is better than our last week and that we may today find a new truth that gives us some sense of clarity how to move forward. And, and I, I feel like I've been in that season of repeat for a long time. But the question I have is who is the risen Christ you're actually worshiping that the Bible talks about? Do you know his heart? Have you experienced his heart for you? Have you experienced what Jesus is truly like? This has come at a place for me. You know, it's been an ongoing struggle of sin, shame, regret, questioning for 10 years, just like a cycle. And you can be a true follower of Jesus and be stuck in a cycle like that. And I'm not saying that I'm not out of that cycle. I'm just saying I needed to settle the question in my own heart, is Jesus, has his patience for me run out? Am I wearing thin on him? Or does he actually love me at my worst? Like the heart of Christ, it actually reaches out to me in the parts of my heart that I don't share with my small group. That's where his heart actually is drawn to. That's been a transformative truth for me. So what I had to figure out is if this is true, if the, what the Bible says is actually true, I wanted to truly experience it because I was starting to not enjoy being a Christian, if I'm honest, because it feels like a losing battle all the time. If you are stuck in a cycle of just hearing about the story of Jesus and not experiencing his heart. So I want to tell you a little bit about who Jesus is. And here's a list. He handles us really tenderly. There's never a sliver of manipulation, never. He's straightforward. He never deals with us harshly. He doesn't put us on hold. We don't have to like wait in a call line for him to pick up. He's always accessible. He's not like a politician or a famous person where you have to get through the guards to get to him. He's totally full of grace and is full of love towards us. All we have to do is collapse into him. Like the way to get to Jesus is not like up a ladder. You're climbing the ladder. It's actually like falling back. And I think I've spent a lot of my life either with too much pride to do that or not enough trust to actually trust him that he's there. But the way to Jesus is the way of letting go. So we must, not, we, we must know who he really is, not just know the stories about his life. I'm like a VeggieTales kid. I'm going way over. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I have to hurry up. Okay, I, I grew up like a VeggieTales kid. And I, I know all these stories. But what I have to understand is that just knowing the story about his life is not experiencing the fullness of experiencing his heart. So how do you go from exposure to experience? It's, it's, it's so simple. Like, I, I can't believe it's this simple every day. And this is why I feel like I fail at it every day. It's simply gazing at him. That's literally, the, if you were to ask me, what's the biggest thing you've done in your life to actually experience the heart of Christ? It's looking at him and thinking about him and sitting with him. It's, I've done every study, guys. I've listened to every podcast. I've read every book. I've done every Bible class. And those all gave me a base of knowledge, but I didn't know what I was missing until I sat and looked at him and thought about his heart for me. 
So it's nothing more. Asking the question, who is Jesus really? So I want to invite you this morning to ask that question. To ask Jesus to show you his heart. If you want to experience his heart. Because he longs to, for us to know how much he really loves us. That's all he's ever been concerned about is us knowing that we belong to him, that he gave his son so that we would be able to experience love, not just get out of hell, but to be able to experience him in this lifetime to know peace and to know hope and to know love. It's a simple thing. Looking at Jesus and asking him to show you the real heart of Jesus. It's been transformative for me. And I'm going to invite up Mark now because Mark's going to share with us the next part of the message. And you can come on up. And Mark has just, I am so excited to hear what God has to say through you because God's done a lot in your life. (laughs) (laughs) So here you go. Okay. Well, my name is Mark. And unfortunately, except for the 10th thing, she said everything I was going to say. Uh, I guess most of the time when w- what the Lord is doing in our life right now, it, it didn't start now. Usually there's a, a process involved. And with me, I had been uh, down in Mexico as a missionary, and we had a, a three-month course where they went a lot through the Bible so I could get to know God course. And I learned quite a bit of information there. And most of my life, I didn't really study the Bible. I listened to other people. And I didn't have a lot of depth on things. I had a lot of general knowledge, and I could apply that. And I had a pretty solid prayer life, but I had never really got into the Word. And I I was thinking a while back, I had met this guy from Eau Claire who would come to Mexico now and then. And when I got back here, I ran into him. I was going to eat at at, a place right down here, the Happy Hollow. And uh, I don't drink, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and he was sitting over his beer, and he looked miserable. His head was down. And I thought, wow, I mean, this guy was like a worship leader and stuff. What, how can this be? So I walked up to talk to him, and he looks up, and he looks like he's ready to cry, and he says, I hate Paul. I'm thinking, who's Paul? Because <laughs> I don't know his context. He says, I hate Paul. I said, you mean the guy that wrote most of the New Testament? He says, yeah, I hate him. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, he said drunkards can't go to heaven. And, and, and I, I just, I can't stand it. And, uh, and I didn't really know what to say because I had some good concepts and some applications in my life, but I didn't really know how to explain to him what was going on. And, and I just said, Lord, give me something here so I can help him. And the Lord gave me kind of a short word for him. And says, he says, I know your battle. You're, you're a tired soldier, but I give you my rest. And when I said that, he was just like broke. And and he just collapsed against me, and he was crying. I mean, it's a Friday night crowd. And you know someone's desperate when they're doing that in front of you. And I don't mean just like some tears. I mean like full-blown bubbles out of his nose all over my shirt. And I'm thinking, man, this was a new shirt. (laughs) So, but again, I I really didn't know what to say. And I I was always going to study it. I was always going to look into how I could help him. But... I kind of dragged my feet. So when a few years go by, and uh, I started hanging out at Red Cedar down at Micon, and I was looking for a scripture, something I wanted to read for someone, and uh, I come across this in Ephesians, and it says that I'm mentioning to my prayers that the Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory of the Father, will give you a spirit of understanding and revelation and the knowledge of him. I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so then I'm still turning the pages because I was looking for something else, and the first thing I hit is in Colossians 1 9, it says, For this reason also, since the day we have heard it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in spiritual wisdom and understanding. I thought, I'm picking up a theme here. So I thought, well, maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. So I turned some pages and I'm back in Luke. And when the Lord came back after he was crucified, he was in a room with the apostles, and he says, then he opened their minds to understand scripture. 
And I'm thinking, okay, this is those times the Lord's giving me a little nudge. So maybe I better start reading. So I thought, well, I'll go back to that little program they had on Proverbs. And if you don't know it, uh, with Proverbs, like today's the first day of the month, you'd read Proverbs 1, meditate on it a little bit. And it, it's very short. And most, depends on the size of print, usually that's about a page or so. And it was day two, second day. So I open it up, and, in, and it says, starts in the second verse two. It says, make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. If you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And I thought, wow, you know, he's all but picked up the Bible and slapped me around with it here. <laughs> so I thought, well, I had better, I'd better start doing things. But for me, and you, you pick up so much, but I wasn't discerning everything. So I got into deeper studies. I started getting commentaries. And I started searching things out. And as this process has moved along, I realized I knew how to answer. I knew how to tell him. The reason you are so absolutely miserable is because the Lord is really in you. And that, I know that sounds strange, but when the Lord, when you're reborn, when you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, when you know in your heart God raised Jesus from the dead, your spirit is renewed, and he seals that with your spirit. But as Paul says, there's a battle between the spirit and the flesh. Yeah. And the, the Lord is trying to make you more like him with his spirit, but it's fighting against like him with his alcohol addiction. I'd had the alcohol addiction. I know what it's like. And I mean, there's so many addictions. There's so many issues people have, possibly with food. I don't know. <laughs> but there are things out there that we struggle with. But that spirit of the Lord, he loves you. He is never going to give up trying yeah. to change you. Yeah. And I'd like to see him again to see if, if he came to that knowledge. I would dearly love to, to just talk with him again right now. But that started me on a journey to be able to, to, to know and understand. And I came to realize that the knowledge, it's just not informational. It's relational. The more you read it, the more you learn about God. And, and so many times we look at this entire book and we think, oh, there's so much there. It's so hard to start. But all you have to do is start. You don't have to memorize it. You just keep putting that information in. And, and the Lord will bring it to you when you need it. Yeah. And I was thinking about it, because I wrote most of this last night after uh, one fest, <laughs> that uh, what, what is the knowledge and understanding? And, and if the knowledge is relational, what is the understanding? And in, in 1 Peter 3.15, it says that, you need to be able to defend your faith to anybody who talks to you. And it, and it came to me. The, Jesus gave two commandments. Love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, and soul. And that is the word. That is learning who he is, learning your discernment, and being one with him in things. And it will change your mind. But the understanding, it's not always for you. Because the other part is that love your neighbor is yourself. So if you understand it, you can share it with your neighbor. And that was the part that the Lord was really putting on me, was to be able to take what he gave me in the word and to be able to share it with others. And that is what's been changing my journey. That is that is the part that I guess I hadn't really prepared myself for. I, I love to give testimony, but I don't always give scripture. and Because to me, testimony, it's like the superpower God gives you. I mean, we've got all the hero movies, you know, Marvel and DC and all this, and all these great powers. But it says in, in Revelation 12, 11, that you can overcome the enemy by the power of your testimony and the blood of the Lamb. So if you think about it, you know what the blood of the Lamb can do. How strong is the testimony? And the more you give it, the stronger you get. And, and that's the, the process that the Lord's been putting me through. That's what the Lord's been putting in my life. And, and I enjoy it. The, the more I read the more I like. And it took a while. I know I was kicking and screaming all the way to have to really do my own work. But uh, I love it. I love it. And, and it just keeps getting better with time. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, who's next? Okay. Thanks, Mark. So my husband and I love games. Board games, 
card games, video games. Anybody here like games at all? I know a few of you do because I played games with a few of you. Um, so we love playing games together. Um, but something I've noticed over the years is that it's almost like there's two different sides of me. That there's the casual Abby who like wants to have fun, hang out with my friends, eat a plate of cookies. One time I had uh, 13 cookies at Scott and Becky's house when we played <laughs> games. That happened. Um, and then there's the competitive side of me. So this is the, the side that's all together different. And um, about oh, five or six years ago, that competitive side of me really came out. So my husband and I, we were playing uh, a card game with some friends. And this card game, you could specifically target and attack people, right? And so I'm waiting for my turn to come around and it gets to me and on my turn, my husband targets and attacks me and I don't get to do what I wanna do. <laughs> So right away, I'm, I'm just like a little frustrated. Okay, okay. It goes around the table again, and the second turn in a row, he targets and attacks me, and it just makes it so I can't do anything. So I'm starting to get a little more frustrated. Goes around the table, comes to my turn, and a third time in a row, he targets and attacks me, and at this point, I'm so mad, I switch. No longer casual, fun-loving, board game Abby. Like, I'm ready to go to war. So every turn for the rest of the game, I'm just retaliating again and again and again. And uh, we get to the end of the game, and my husband loses, which was my objective, right? At this point, I didn't even care who won. Did I lose? Also, yes. I also <laughs> lost because I completely targeted him. Um, and it just showed me in that moment that there are two drastically different sides of board game and card game Abby. And that's what we're talking about this morning is there are two different sides of me. There are two ways to live. Spiritually, the Apostle Paul talks about this a lot, and I love that you brought it up. Isn't it great how God kind of weaves everything together? Um, in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 6, Paul says this. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. So we see that Paul brings up these two different ways to live, to live in the flesh or to live in the spirit. One way to break it down is this, that flesh equals me and spirit equals God in me. So I can live my life focused on myself, gazing at myself and my situations, wanting to um, pursue the things that make me happy, wanting situations to go the way I please. Or I can live in a different way and I can gaze upon Christ. I can live every moment seeking out communion and connection with him. There's a diagram that I think explains this. It's very complicated. We'll have it on the screen. A single line. If you have been around movement for a while, you might have seen this diagram before. Um, I like to think of it as a single line, that below the line is my flesh. That's me living for me and me alone. Above the line is living into the spirit, God in me. Now, at any point of time, any point of time, any day, you and I can be living above the line or below the line. And a lot of times, it kind of goes back and forth. Right? So you wake up and you check your Facebook and kind of like Holly said, every morning I wake up, it's almost like I'm re-lost. Like we start our day below the line, maybe not even connecting with God at all. We get ready and then on the way to work, our favorite worship song comes on. And suddenly we feel pulled towards God and reminded of his presence and reminded of his spirit. And so we walk into work and we're above the line, communing with God, ready to evangelize <laughs> to all our coworkers, right? But then we get there and our coworker called in sick and the plumbing leaked again and our project wasn't approved. And all of a sudden, by the end of the day, we find ourselves all the way back down here, living for me, gazing at me, living in the flesh. And I think a lot of times we go through the week and we have a lot of those flesh days and then we come to church and we have a little bloop up to the spirit and then boop back down to the flesh. Um, and it's kind of a place that we can end up living just focused on ourselves. A prime example of that is me. Uh, this is a message that God has been speaking to me for many years. And um, 
honestly has been something that he's put on my heart a lot lately because in December, December 28th of 2021, I gave birth to two beautiful little boys. And so uh, this is an interesting season for me because my husband and I had never changed a diaper. Um, we had never babysat. And so all of a sudden, the hospital staff is sending us home with not one, but two babies. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do with that? And we get home and I completely went into survival mode. I did not know how, like, I was not worried about connecting with God. I was worried about, like, not letting the babies die, right? <laughs> like, that's all that I cared about. And I began to live into my flesh, where when I was weary, instead of turning to God, I turned to TV. When I was wanting something, I didn't care about how it affected my, my spirit at all. I just wanted what I wanted. And there were several months at the beginning of this year um, where I was really just living there. I was living there in the flesh until about, I would say about six weeks ago. I was sitting right there <laughs> in this room. And God, by his grace and by his mercy, reminded me of this. He reminded me that it's, it's easy to live in the flesh, but when we live in the flesh, it makes life harder. Yes. That when I live in the flesh, my struggles are so much harder because I'm not gazing upon the one who gives me strength. Yes. I'm not gazing upon the one who gives me grace and mercy, who fills me up. Instead, when I choose to live in the flesh, I'm living on empty. Yes. And so God reminded me of that. He, he reached out and he said, hey, hun, you're below the line. I want you to look at me. I want you to be connected to me in my presence, in my spirit. You see, because this applies to our whole lives. I can go to church in the flesh if I don't care. If my heart's not attuned to God, I can go sit in any church and just have it go right over my head, right? I can read a Bible verse and close the Bible and be like, huh, I don't know what that said, but I read it, right? Like, you can do all the spiritual things in the flesh. But in the same way, you can do all of the mundane, everyday life things in the spirit. That I can get up and I can lay in my bed and just, like, commune with God, right? Like, I can eat a bowl of soup and have a conversation with the Lord that his spirit can be with me and in me in all circumstances. Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 through 25 says this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm a how kind of person. Like, you can tell me all the what's, you can tell me all the why's, but I need the how. Like, I can look at this and be like, okay, there's that, that line. How do I do it? How do I connect with God? How do I gaze at the Lord? And when I was sitting in that chair, I remember asking God the same thing. Okay, so I am in my flesh. How do I change that? And I think it looks a little bit different for everybody. But for me, in that seat, what he told me is he said, spend time alone with me. Serve. Serve my people. And meet with other like-minded Christians and talk about me. Share what you're learning about me. And those things will help to draw you into my presence. So I have a list of ideas, a list of ideas of different things that we can do up on the screen. And let me preface this by saying, these are just actions. If your heart's not in it, it's not going to do anything. But if you decide to turn your gaze to God and to seek him with all your heart, he can do amazing and powerful things through little steps of obedience, like watching a sunrise with God, like singing along to worship music, praying out loud in the car. God can do amazing things through even little steps. And so we're going to take 20 seconds, 30 seconds this morning, and I want to encourage you to look at this list and write two down, write two or three down, ask the Lord, how are you calling me to fix my eyes upon you? And maybe it's not even on this list. Maybe he brings something else to mind, but grab your notebook. If you don't have one, you should, but if you don't have one, grab the offering envelope, text it to yourself, whatever you need to do. We're going to take this time just to write down ways that this week we can gaze upon the Lord.
So, Lord, we thank you that you are a God who speaks to us, that you're not a God who is silent or leaves us on our own, but that you're a God who will never leave us or forsake us. And, Lord, I'm reminded in Scripture that you speak to a young man by the name of Samuel. The only thing is that uh, he doesn't particularly know that you're speaking to him. He's doing other things, and he's busy. And uh, I think sometimes what we do in life is that we're so busy we forget that you're speaking to us. And so I encourage you, uh, if you're kind of in the seat right now, just kind of palms up uh, toward God. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would give us ears to hear. That we know that you're speaking. And in this moment, we just simply say with our own hearts and our own lives, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. That, Father, the book of Acts didn't end with the ending of that which is written in the New Testament, but it continues here in this room today. It continues in our hearts and lives throughout the week as we are led and guided by your Holy Spirit. As people give their hearts and lives to you, as you uh, reach out in miracles and uh, physical bodies, as you uh, restore marriages, as you free us from addiction, that we continue to see the working of your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I pray that throughout this week we would have a prayer that would just simply say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And that, Lord, we would give you space to speak. That, Lord, as each one of the people who came up here today, what they did is they didn't testify of how incredible they were. They testified of how incredible you are and that your voice is speaking to them. And so in that same way, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us, that we might hear your voice that we might be led by your spirit and that as a result that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us ears to hear today all that you're doing in our hearts and lives. We ask all of this in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me?